It is a great honor and a privilege to introduce Judith Bodenheimer. Your maiden name was Hirsch. And um, you did, we had your beautiful apartment in Beersheba. And if you can tell us a little bit about your most absolutely incredible life story. Okay. Um, I was born in Holland in 1943, in the middle of Second World War, to a Dutch family. My father's family um, originated in Germany and um, in the in the 1700s they moved to Holland. Uh, they were in the printing business and uh, a lot of the printing businesses moved to Amsterdam and that's how for many generations already my family my father's family was in Holland, the Hirsch family. Um, my father's family consisted of, uh, his father was uh, Rabbi um, Shmuel Yehuda Hirsch and my grandmother Betty uh, Brendel Neivormser from Germany. They had ten children. Um, three sons and five daughters and I would like to show you a photo of the whole family in the beginning of the war um, this was a wedding in 1940 of one of my aunts my brother my father's sister um, where all the family was pre present. Some of the uh, siblings were married, um, some of the sisters were married, the two, two brothers were, uh, my father and one of his brothers were engaged and everybody was here. This is the beginning of the war, 1940. Um, this was my my grandfather, Rabbi Shmuel Yehuda Hirsch. They lived in Zvola. Zvola is the capital city of the uh, province of Overijssel, and he was the chief rabbi of this whole area. And um, that meant that uh, he had to travel a lot and um, sometimes he had to be away for Shabbatot at the, at the different, there were a lot of small towns around and villages and uh, there were a few nice stories about him when he was away for Shabbat. Um, my grandfather loved to give tzedakah and um, as a government officer actually in the clergy he received a good salary from from the government, but he couldn't resist um, giving staka when people came to him. And often my grandmother used to say, I haven't enough money to, to feed the family, you know, uh, it's too much. And this one time when he went to, the, to one of the places for Shabbat, and he came there Friday afternoon, and there was a knock at the door somebody there who came every Friday to ask for tzedakah from this uh, the gentleman who lived there from the family and that day the, the gentleman didn't feel like giving him he said enough now I give you every week manage with what you get so um, my grandfather opened his purse and emptied it out into this man's ha hand so that he would receive something to make Shabbat and the, uh, my grandfather's host said, but Rabbi, how will you pay for the train home? To which my grandfather said, you'll pay for it. So that was a nice story. And one other nice story was when he was away visiting another family for Shabbat, a different, uh, different uh, place. And uh, it was already dark, everybody had gone to bed, and he decided he really wanted to go over his drashad, prepare it properly. 
So he went out of his room to, and he met the maid and he tried to hint to her that he would like some light. But the maid said, Rabbi, please go to bed. You need your sleep. So that was the end of the preparation for, for the drasha that day. Um, the home of uh, my grandparents was apparently a very uh, happy family. Um, lots of people came in always. My, f my grandfather, when uh, German uh, refugees came into Holland thinking it would be safe, he was always busy looking after them, trying to find the places to live and, and so on. Um, but uh, I was told by a lady who lived, grew up near there, told stories of the family, that uh, as you come into the house, on the left side is a room with a big dining table. And when the children came home from school, they all went there and sat round the table. And uh, while they were doing their homework, they sang songs. So it sounds like a happy family. My father, one of the three sons, um, was a, what they call a chevreman. He, he was not such a learner, but more a doer. And he organized all kinds of things. He um, helped his father with collecting money to send to, to Israel. I forget the name of the organization, it still exists today. And whenever there was some going on, he used to collect the money and uh, organize things. And one special thing about him is that he was a traveling salesman for bicycle parts, which, uh, of course, in Holland, people are on bicycles all the time, so this was good business. And he organized, and in Holland, generally, a lot of the Jewish uh, men were traveling salesmen. And he organized that in all set different places around Holland where there were Jews, he organized that there would be kosher sandwiches for the people, for the travelers to buy as they were traveling miles and miles all over the country. Um, that's a little about, about my, my father's family. Um, my mother's family, uh, my grandfather was called uh, again Shmuel, Shmuel Binyamin Natans. He was a doctor. And in the family lived in Groningen. Um, he was actually a police doctor, which meant that the police called him whenever there was some accident or some incident in public area or wherever a doctor was needed. My grandfather already had a car, an old Ford, and um, he had a bell in it. So when the police needed him, they rang, somehow they rang his bell, and then he rushed to the closest house that had a telephone. Not everybody had telephones yet in those days. And then he used to call the police to, um, to find out where he was needed. He was also uh, present at very many sports uh, occasions, football um, games, and my mother used to sometimes go with him. My mother was very, uh, very fond of him. They had a very close collection, connection. My mother, her first name was Renée, Renée Selma Natans, and she was uh, a secretary by profession. Um, she, my grandmother, first of all, uh, was called Netje, uh, from the family Zadox, and I'm called after her. My Dutch name is Nettie, um, and um, she came from um, a well-to-do family, and they lived in a big house with two maids. Now, this helped my grandfather, um, who had to see patients also on Shabbat. So before Shabbat, during the week, he used to prepare a lot of prescriptions for um, remedies, for medicines that were often used. And then on Shabbat, after he came home from shul, he used to sit in his office at home 
receive patients and then the maid would write the name of the patient and the date. All these prescriptions were already ready and signed. And that's how he could keep Shabbat and also see to his patients, to his clinic. Um, my parents um, met through the Aguda camp um, and um, got to know each other there and um, they got engaged already in 1940 apparently and here is a picture of my mother's family my mother had one brother called in Dutch uh, Philip uh, Martin Philip uh, but his Hebrew name was Uri Marche and here he is with his also with his fiancée, both of them engaged to be married. Um, my parents got married in 1942, in Nissan 1942, and here is a picture of their wedding. After the chopper, And where were they married? In Groningen. And this is during the war? This is, this is during the war. Uh, they were both in Schnatt and Wilut. Both their fathers had died during the previous year. Um, both from natural causes, that is to say from sickness. And here is a picture I found of the wedding guests at the Souda. And this is the original picture. Original picture, you see how old it is. It's actually quite amazing. Okay, I found another nice picture of my parents' wedding at the Souda. My mother then was 26, my uh, father was 30. Um, okay, my parents got married and then moved to live in Groningen. No, excuse me, they lived in Zwolle, round the corner from my grandparents' house um, in Zwolle. Many years later, the community of Zwolle renamed a street near the shul there after my grandfather. Well, um, life during the war was not so good with all the limitations for the Jews, but my father went on working, traveling the, ro the railroads, selling. My mother stayed at home um, and um, Baruch Hashem she became pregnant after three months and um, and they prepared for for the birth well it took almost a year for things to be gradually things became worse in Holland generally I won't detail that much one can read about that in all the books but um, my pair. I found a note that my parents prepared for the birth and bought a layette. They bought clothes for babies and and um, a, a pram for twins because ten days before the expected birth, the doctor told my mother she's expecting twins. So they already brought bought everything that they might need. But on Shabbat, the 10th of April, Hei Nisan, in 1943, Zvola, the Jews of Zvola were told they have to leave home and take the train to Fürth, which was a concentration camp in Holland. So my father had heard already about it and he knew he's not going there. 
He is going elsewhere. It was Shabbat. They were Shomrei Shabbat, but was to save their lives. They had to travel on Shabbat. And m my father bought a ticket for my mother because he himself had a subscription ticket. They got onto the train with all the things that they had prepared for the babies they were expecting, and they traveled to Amsterdam. When they arrived in Amsterdam, they walked all the way, which is quite a long way because we, we were there recently and we checked it. Um, there was a family, friends of the family, the family Birnbaum, that had a big house in the Sofatistraat in Amsterdam. And uh, my parents walked there to the house. Um, there were already my uncle, my father's brother, Fried, and his fiancée, Gerda Ne Khan, were already there with other family members. And um, my father quickly went out to look for a Jewish doctor to prepare in case for when my mother would give birth. Well, the following day, already, my mother gave birth. Around uh, midday, the doctor came, and my aunt Gerda, she was a nurse, so she also assisted with the, with the birth. So first, my sister, Shulamit, was born. Shulamit Betty. Again, Betty, after the name of our paternal um, grandmother and after 20 minutes I was born, Judith Netty. Of course there was great happiness in the house, two healthy babies uh, at a good weight and, uh, and uh, the parents had brought everything they needed for the babies and, and they were did, Was it a home birth? It was a home birth, yes. A home birth and all went well. Baruch Hashem. Was it too dangerous to go to the hospital or...? I think in those days perhaps people did give birth at home. I'm not sure. So this was on Vav Nisan, just before Pesach. So they were there for Pesach, Seder, and there were a lot of people in the house and everybody was happy to help with the babies, with the laundry and hanging up the nappies. And, um, but then after Pesach, we were six weeks old and uh, the um, Nazis, the, uh, the next um, uh, instruction was that all the Jews from Amsterdam had to leave their homes and go to the central, the main theater in Amsterdam. They should take their bags, whatever they needed, and whatever they could carry and go there. So unfortunately, we had to leave. We were just six weeks old. And um, so there we were. Um, I understand that we were there just a few days. It was not a big place. It couldn't hold all the people who, who arrived there from the different areas of Amsterdam. Beforehand, a lot of people from different towns, different places in Holland had already been sent to Amsterdam so that most of the Jews were already in Amsterdam. And now they were all told to go to the, to the theater. So eventually, train after train left from Amsterdam to go to Westerborg. Westerborg was a concentration camp in the northeast of Holland, close to the border of Germany, which originally in the beginning of the war, when a lot of uh, Jewish um, refugees came from Germany, thinking that Holland would remain neutral like during the First World War. So the government built this, this Westerborg place with little huts for families to live and, um, 
It stayed like that for a number of years, but then when the Nazis came to power and needed a place to collect all the Jews, they made it into a concentration camp for not only the German Jews who had arrived, but also all the Dutch Jews. And all the Dutch Jews, except for those who went into hiding, arrived at Westerbog. My uncle, uh, Fried, uh, also arrived there, but somehow he managed to escape and went into hiding. But that's another story. Uh, in Westerbork, all our family arrived, my grandmothers, my aunts and uncles and uh, cousins. And uh, the, the um, men and the women, of course, were separated into different barracks, the children with the mothers. And everybody had to work except for the women who were looking after small children. There were a, a lot of young people there, some who had come from Harshara camps preparing to go to Israel, and they were very active trying to keep the children busy, set up some kind of school, and made did organize, they organized all kinds of uh, activities for the children, made parties, Hanukkah parties, and uh, etc. Now, at Westerbog, the one bad thing, the weekly tragedies occurred. From Westerbog, trains left to the east, once a week on Tuesday. To the east meant People didn't know what the East was, they thought it's two working camps. But in fact, they went to Auschwitz, to Theresienstadt, or to Sobibor. Every Monday evening, lists would come out with a thousand names of people who the following morning would have to take their packages, their belongings, and get onto the train that would take them East. These were terrible evenings. People used to cry and take leave and try to get off the list, but trying to take get your name off the list would mean somebody else would replace you. These were terrible dilemmas. But so it happened that my grandmothers, my aunts, my uncles, most of them were deported. Um, my grandmother, my mother's mother, one evening, it was July, so we were there from, um, from May to July, two months, her name appeared. And, but two weeks beforehand, her son, my mother's only brother, with his pregnant wife, were already transferred. They were already on the list and had gone east. And now, two weeks later, it was my grandmother's turn. My grandmother came to my mother to say goodbye, to tell her she's leaving, she has, she's on the list. But my mother was sleeping and my grandmother didn't want to wake her up because my mother had difficulty with bringing up two small children and she needed her sleep so what did she do she wrote her a letter i looked for the letter i found it uh, some years ago but at the moment i couldn't find it so i will just tell you about it she wrote dear renee my i'm on the list as i expected but i'm expect i am accepting my fate I hope to meet Martin and Jenny when I arrive. Meanwhile, don't worry about, your about the girls. The babies, they're strong. You have plenty of milk. Just be happy, look after them. And you have Benz to look, help you look after him. Goodbye, your loving mother, and a kiss. Well, my grandmother was on the, on the train which arrived at Sobibor. She did not meet her son. Her fate was like her son's fate on arrival in Sobibor. 
in the gas chambers. Hashem become the mum. We stayed in Bergen Belsen until February. So my father was working there. I don't know exactly what. Probably some of the time in the kitchen. I have some pictures here that I would like to show you. Here's a picture of us. How old are you at this time? In August, so we were four months old. And you know where the picture was taken? In August. But where? In Westerbork. In Westerbork. In Westerbork. This is my sister Schuller and this is me. We were not identical, we still are not identical. And here are two pictures of my parents in Westerbork at the same time in August 1943. You did, can I do you know why, in a way, it was a mazal that you were sent to Bergen-Belsen? And yes, I will tell you why. Uh, just one moment, I would like to show you one more f uh, item. I found this, it's very old. This is original. I had one of my sisters, but I can't find it. This is something that all babies got to, I don't know how. Look at it. This was attached to us. This one is attached to me. My name is on the other side. This is Lager Westerbrook, 11th of the 4th, 43. That was our, uh, our uh, birthday. Nettie, date. Judith, Hirsch. And this is the original. Yes. How did you keep it all these years? My mother kept all these things. I don't know how. Niederlandse Rude Christ, uh, the, the Red Cross. The yes. And it came in a package. This is unbelievable. Yes. That's so, that's priceless. Yes. Now I'll tell you the story of how when our time came to be sent to the East, we were sent to Bergen-Belsen. My father had cousins in Zurich. Um, the family Wormser and they um, like many Swiss people procured papers for us um, both um, affidavits to entry into Palestine and visas passports to Paraguay South American country the consul there um, wrote these out to all kinds of people in a lot in Poland and in and in uh, and in Holland, and in fact they procured them for all our family, that is to say for the Hirsch family. But unfortunately, the papers arrived too late to save my grandmother and and the other aunts. But we, we were lucky. We, and together with my aunt, um, oh, here's a picture. This is a picture of my grandmother. I showed you one of my grandfather before. This is my grandmother Hirsch. After whom I'm named. No, no, after whom my sister Shula is named. Now, together with us in Bergen Belsen was my aunt, my, my father's sister, Ella. This is her name. 
This is my aunt in later years. And actually here, here's a picture of my father also when he was younger and healthy. Okay. And um, so my aunt Ella was married to Shimon Koltov. So this uncle and aunt had one son, Shmuel, who is uh, almost a year older than us. They were together with us also in, in, um, in Vesterborg and they were, came together with us to Bergen-Belsen because they were also saved by these papers of, um, from the Swiss family. So we were sent in February 1944, we were sent to Bergen-Belsen. Now Bergen-Belsen was not uh, an, an extermination camp like Auschwitz, Sobibor and many other camps. Um, it was actually, we were hostages because at the time there were a lot of German Templars, religious Christian Germans who came to live in the Holy Land and as soon as the Nazis came to power they were very much out of favour and were going to be expelled from Palestine and so they, uh, the Germans kept us as hostages as a, as a possible exchange for these Templars. In the beginning Bergen-Belsen was bearable if you can say so. It was a concentration camp with strict rules, men and women separate and everybody had to work except for mothers looking after babies and every day the, the upper excuse me, the famous appell where they had to stand outside for hours being counted and those inside with babies or sick people were counted inside. My father worked partly with shoes I think and partly with in the kitchen. There was a time my parents still had their pram, their twin pram and the men who had to carry the enormous uh, saucepans with food to the different places were so burdened and as slowly they were getting weakened they took the pram uh, to use it to help them transport the food and um, the situation there in Bergen-Belsen was getting worse and worse uh, there was a lot of sickness, malnourishment, people died in the beginning a bit, later on much more uh, of all ages, old, young, babies. We were m miraculously saved. It was a, it was a miracle, Bermette and Ness, that we were kept alive. Many months my mother had enough milk to nurse us. In fact she tried to nurse two other babies to keep them alive but they didn't survive. Uh, eventually that ran out because she herself was malnourished and um, she used to feed us. We did not develop very well of course. Uh, we just lay in bed crying and uh, we were you know the bunks, three tier bunks and my mother was uh, on top and we were below and she used to hand down a food to us and we were crying and um, there was time when my mother was also ill and had to be in the infirmary and then we were brought over to my father and he would look after us and he could not work because he was looking after us and uh, he, sometimes he was a little sorry that he had to return us to our mother when she when she recovered but things became worse and worse and worse eventually you know the when the Germans started losing the war and they emptied out Auschwitz and other camps and uh, there were death marches many of which arrived at Bergen-Belsen and the uh, the density was impossible 
sanitary situation was worse than before. In the beginning, in the very beginning, my mother told me she still had a bucket to wash our nappies at night and she used to rinse, leave them in water at night and the sanitary conditions were very bad. By the morning, she'd found that somebody had used the bucket Aye. for their own needs. There was a lot of typhus as well. Tremendous. There was a lot of typhus. Yes, a lot of typhus. And, um, well, time passed and um, I won't tell you more about it. Do you I have any recollection? I have no recollection. I have no recollection. I have read many, many books about it, but I have no recollection. No. You were too young, you were. Yes, yes. But uh, nowadays it's known that one's experience pre-verbalization mm. re remain in the memory somehow. Towards the end, uh, I'll jump over to, towards the end. End of the war was coming. The Germans were afraid that, that the Allied forces would uh, discover what went on there. And they tried to clear the camp, Bergen-Belsen. They got three trains and they put, they told all the people to go onto the trains. Those who could go, who could walk, who could crawl, who could be taken. My mother was sick then and she was, uh, um, she happened to be in the infirmary and um, um, so she was brought there by lorry. It was some time, some walk to go to to the station, and she was so happy to see that my father, with his last cohort, last energy, held us and brought us to the train. And I just remembered a story I want to tell about my aunt, my aunt Gerda Hirsch. She was a nurse and she worked as a nurse all the time. She was very, very uh, religious and she had to write, of course. She had two pencils. She had one pencil that she used to write notes at work during the week and she had one pencil that she called her Shabbos pencil. She wrote only on Shabbos. This, the extent to which she wanted to keep mitzvahs so much Another story I still want to tell about Bergen Belsen before we left. My uncle Shimon, he was a mathematician and a maths teacher. And during that time, not to lose trace of the time, he made a, a calendar, a Luach Shana, with all the times, the days when is uh, Shabbos, when is Yontif. And one day he came to my mother and said, uh, Good morning, René. Good Yontif. It's Shavuos. So people tried as much as possible to keep to their Yiddishkeit. And also, it was told to me after the war by somebody whom I met many years later, who knew my parents there, how my parents remained humane and tried to help other people where they could, and uh, especially my father, because this was his... Uh, his personality. So to go back to the train, there were three trains. Nobody knew where they were going to. We were on one train with 2,500 people. Uh, we were together in the same part as my uncle and aunt Koltov with the son Shmuel and, um, and my aunt Gerda. Now this train traveled um, along Germany. Bergen-Belsen was in the north west and it went east all the way down to, Bergen, to Berlin. It drove and it stopped and it traveled and it stopped and nobody knew where it was going. They thought perhaps Theresienstadt. There were always rumors going around but nobody knew anything for fact. And sometimes the train stopped and people got off 
to look for food because at the beginning of the tra uh, journey, I think they got each a loaf of bread and some and some raw beets. So people were looking for food and drink. And then when the train left, they rushed back and uh, and sometimes it stopped in a, a field and people went out to look for food, came back. Why did they come back? Because they had nowhere else to go and their family was there. And uh, there was a miracle once that the, the train was standing in a station and people went down and suddenly there was a rush. Everybody back, 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 quickly get up onto the train again. They went back and the train moved and had it, it had just moved and a bomb fell on the station. Wow. Baruch Hashem. There were so many miracles. So the train went on for two weeks. Now part of the time, of course, naturally, people are undernourished and sick with typhus and many people died on the trip. Every time the train stopped, the bodies were taken down off the train and the men with this little um, energy that they had, they dug into the ground and tried to bury these people in a mass grave. And then there was there were two men responsible, uh, a Mr. Weiss, he was a, a lawyer in advance uh, before the war, and he made a note of who died and where, according to the rail, railroad markings so that after the war there were lists put out so to save people from problems to know where their relatives were buried when they were, had died and this happened many times eventually it happened to my father too he died the train had already arrived this was after they after they came to Berlin, Berlin was devastated, was destroyed, utterly destroyed, and my mother was very happy to see it, she told me. And after Berlin, it went southward, it was already East, East Germany, and there my father died, also from typhus and undernourishment, and he was lowered into a mass grave, together with, I think, 15 or 20 people. I have the list, I forget by heart. And my mother apparently had a yellow blanket and she told them to wrap his body in this yellow blanket. I think she said something about he still was wearing his tzitzis. I'm not sure. As they took his body out, my mother screamed and they told her to hush, to be quiet. After that she remained quiet. The train went on and my mother began to realize that she's alone, she would have to, to work to earn a living. And since she was the secretary before the war and she had done shorthand, she said to my aunt, just talk to me or tell me things and I will try to remember my shorthand so that when we come back to, hopefully to normal life, I can go out to work and earn a living again. The train went on, it was finally two weeks Afterwards, they called this train the lost transport because nobody knew where it was going. It was finally stopped in, um, in a forest somewhere. Some Russian soldiers came and stopped it. The German uh, drivers ran out and escaped. And the Russian soldiers said to everybody, you're free, you can come out. But of course, most people were too weak to come out. But eventually, they all came out or were helped out. 
and there were two people who found a bicycle and went to look for help and um, help came from Russian soldiers, American soldiers, I'm not quite sure. Um, this was in the middle of an area of villages and the people were distributed into villages. Um, our family, that is to say the Koltovs and Aunt Gerda and us, we arrived in Trobitz, which was a nice little village. The people saw these people coming and they did not look human after so many years of concentration camp and malnutrition and sickness. They were afraid and they ran away. They left a lot of the houses empty with food on the table, beds made, and the refugees just moved into these houses. Many, of course, ate too much for their weak bodies and died, as we have heard many stories like that. And apart from that, many people succumbed to the typhus that they had got in, in Bergen-Belsen. There was one doctor there who had been looking after the patients all the time, Unfortunately, he also succumbed there. And there in Trobitz, um, the, um, the municipality made an enormous big um, communal grave for the people who had died. Eventually, they opened a cemetery for, for Jewish, um, Jewish uh, death where the people were lucky. Finally, they could have their own grave because so many people had no grave at all after so many years. Bergen Belsen was left with massive amounts of death who were buried in mass graves. You can see when you go there now, there are small hills covering these mass graves. So this is what happened in Trobitz also. The mayor of Trobitz, who was extremely helpful, also caught the typhus and died. There, were, there was another lady who many years looked after the, um, after the grave, of the graveyard, the Jewish graveyard, and was in correspondence with um, survivors. Now I'll just tell you about the time that we spent in Trobitz. Can I just ask you, did yes. what date did w w were you free? Did the twenty fourth of April. We April. left Bergen Belsen on the tenth of April. Eleventh of April was our birthday. We had our second birthday in the train. We could not sit. We could not walk. We could not stand. We were too weak. We were very. Uh, underdeveloped, we couldn't talk, only cry. And this was, uh, the end was 24th of April. Now, after this time, gradually people were repatriated to their original countries. Uh, meanwhile, the Russians or the Americans, I'm not sure, opened hospitals for people there until they could um, get onto their feet well enough to be repatriated. Um, there was one incident, my mother told me that the Russians tried to take advantage of the women and uh, my mother was in bed and the Russian came in and my mother said, I have typhus, I have typhus. So he ran away because he was scared for himself. Hashem. Um, now, my uncle was very, very sick, Shimon Koltov, and he was in hospital for a long time. My mother wanted to wait for him to be repatriated, so we waited until the last, till the end, till August. Only in August did we get onto a train. Uh, first, they brought us on lorries. Um, to some place in Germany from where we got a train and my mother remembers the countryside, how beautiful it was and she enjoyed seeing the, the poppies. <laughs> and um, 
So we were together with uh, my uncle and aunt, Shimon and Ella, and, and Gerda. And we arrived finally in Maastricht, in Holland, and from there to Amsterdam. In Amsterdam, there were lists already uh, of people who were expected to arrive. People came to the train station, and my aunt Gerda had a sister already in Amsterdam. I don't know what her story was, but she came to receive us. And then we were relegated to one of two refugee homes that the government of Holland had established um, to receive the those who came back from the camps. Um, my mother discovered that the home we were in was not kosher and she asked to be removed to be moved over to the other. So we were there together. It's called the Yotz Invalida, which meant that it was actually the original Jewish hospital before the war. And um, where my aunt had worked before the war. So we were there with the Koltovs and my aunt, and meanwhile, my uncle, Fried, had also returned from hiding. And my uncle and aunt, before the war, had had a civil marriage, but they hadn't managed to get a chuppah. After the war, they had a chuppah. It was a very, very sad occasion. Very few people arrived. and. My aunt, she, till the end of her life, never forgot Bergen Belsen and always talked about it, as if it still happened today. They had one son, they have one son, he lives fortunately, he's called Chaim, who Baruch Hashem has a wonderful family. Um, so we were in the Yotze Invalida. Now, my aunt and my mother were not well enough to look after us yet. So they were still recuperating. And meanwhile, in, Bergen, in the Yotze Invalida was a family Birnbaum who um, had a, um, remind me please, what is it called? A home for Orphanage. Yes, an orphanage. Before the, before the war they already had an orphanage. During the war also in bergen Belsen, they carried on an orphanage and took in children whose parents had died. And now being back in Holland, in the Jotse in Belida, they again opened it. And they opened it also for children who had come out of hiding, Jewish children who had come out of hiding and had no home. And so we were kept there. And they looked after us, and uh, in fact, there was uh, there's even a film made of that home, a very happy in film, um, where we were being bathed by the daughter of uh, of the Birnbaum family, and we were sitting there, and it was very very happy. And um, eventually, um, we spent actually six months there, uh, I discovered, looking through my papers, we spent six months there. Eventually my mother and my aunt and my uncle recovered well enough to move out of there, but there were very few uh, homes available, there was a sort of homes. The town also had been bombed and my mother there, the Jotze Invalida, met another another widow from Bergen-Belsen, whose husband had died in Bergen-Belsen and was buried there. And she had a son um, of our age. She was called Tante Ruth, and he was called Jopi at the time. Today he's called David. I have contact with him still today. My mother and Tante Ruth decided to set up home together. Two widows with three children, and then perhaps they have more of a chance to, to, get a, to get a flat. And indeed, they got a flat in an old slum neighborhood next to a canal. You know, Amsterdam mm -hmm. is built on canals. And we moved there together. And um, I have just very happy memories of that time. We were good friends, three of us playing. Oh, by the way, I have some photos. 
This is a photo of my mother with us after the war. Is this in Amsterdam? Yes. Okay. And then here's a photo wow. in April 1946, I see, of Shola and David and me as we were growing up there, living w together. Where are you in the photo? Uh, I'm here. I'm in this one. Okay, and another photo I found after the war in the Yotze Invalida. This was Mrs. Birnbaum. This is Shola, and this is me. She was holding us there while we were living there. Yeah. So we went to live together and we started going to kindergarten. And you did, can I ask, do you yes. have recollections of this time? Yes, I have recollections. What is your first recollection that you have? My first recollection is in the Yotsa Invalida. I must have been walking already. I don't know how old I was. Wait a minute, I must have been about three. And I met my uncle, Uncle Fried, on the on the stairway and he gave me a biscuit. I have no idea if there was, that's what I remember. <laughs> and um, so we went to kindergarten together and on Shabbos we used to walk to shul and David used to go and sit with Omfrit in shul and we were in the ladies section. And we had happy, my mother then went out to work. Um, the government at the time still um, gave handouts, allowances, I believe. So really, she wasn't allowed to work, but she did go out to work. She found work with uh, with a lawyer, a secretary, and uh, Tante Wood stayed at home and looked after us and did the household. But once there was an inspection and the government inspector came to see the family, how we were living, and fortunately, my mother just came home with a basket of uh, groceries. She'd been shopping on her way home from, from, uh, from work. So that went by. In fact, it's very... I still have a memory of that flat, the layout. In so, fact, I've sometimes thought of asking David and Shula whether they still remember if they remember it like I do. Anyway, eventually, uh, it was already 1948 and Israel, Medinat Israel came into being and uh, Tante Ruth had a brother living in Tel Aviv and she decided to go on Aliyah. So, um, I'm not sure whether it was in 1949 or 1950, they, they left to go to Israel and we carried on living there. Um, my uncle and aunt Hirsch also lived in Amsterdam and they had a flat in a nicer area. When they went on Aliyah in 1950, my mother and, uh, and we moved into their nicer flat. Somehow she managed it being, being the same surname Hirsch, somehow was a nicer area. So um, we lived there, a nice flat, and um, at that time it was a flat divided into two. We were on the first floor with a kitchen and a toilet and a few bedrooms, and upstairs was another family with a bathroom, so we didn't have a bathroom. So once a week, my mother took us to the bathhouse and we went to have a bath. So apparently one had to pay for a bath, so first we went into the bath and then she quickly went into the bath after us. So these are the funny stories about our youth. On Shabbos, we used to go to Shul, walk to Shul, it was quite a distance, to the Jakob Obrechtstraat, which was a big old Shul. And from there, we walked to a different area, to my 
My aunt and uncle, they were living in a different area and went to a different shul, to the Lekstad shul, and we used to walk there and stay there and have our Shabbos meals there. And then in the afternoon, um, my cousin Shmuel and we used to walk to Hashel Shelet, which is like today's Ezra. And in the afternoon, my mother came later on to pick us up and we walked home. And all this I remember very well, it was a happy time. And we used to play in the street outside the house in the afternoon with other children. And it was very common for children to have no, no father. Nobody talked about it. Nobody talked about their experiences. For many years, people didn't talk about their experiences. Certainly not children who didn't really know what went on. From where we were, we had we had the bus bus to school and back, and uh, everything was fine. Did you go to a, Jew, a Jewish? We school? We went to a Jewish school. It was called Rosh Pina, and we went there for three years. The first three classes. During the uh, June or July, I think, during that time, during that year, when we were a third year in school, my mother, it seems, decided she wants to remarry. Can I just ask, yes. did your mother ever speak about your father? My mother spoke about my father, but not very much. She used to call him, say, your father. She never said daddy or something, because he was never called that. Um, he, yeah, she used to tell small things about him, yes. Not much, but she also had photos, so we were familiar with his face. And um, the, this picture was, was always up. And, uh, and I uh, don't remember whether she had other pictures then. Maybe she did, perhaps the engagement, I'm not sure. She did speak, but then she decided enough. She needed to get married. She wanted to eventually, Bezrat Hashem, have more children. So she was introduced to Rabbi Munk from London. This is Rabbi Munk in his later years. He died in 1978, at the age of 78. And this is a good picture of my mother, who died in 2013, at the age of 98. 98, wow. <laughs> in Jerusalem. They both died in Jerusalem, are buried on Haraz 18. So they buried in August in 1952 and we moved to London. We left Holland and we moved to London. Can I just ask, and it's yes. a difficult question, but how did you and your sister feel about your mother remarrying? Uh, we just accepted it. We just accepted it. We, I don't remember any, any discussion about, we, we were sort of convinced or they were talking about this would be nice, you would have a father and uh, yeah that was the idea, you would have a father now. So we would be like other mm -hmm. families. So we moved to England and we learned English and we went to school there. My mother from being a very quiet private person became a Rebetzin, a Rabbanit. And she never liked to be called Rabbanit. She used to be called Mrs. Monk. Also the, the Rav was called Rabbi Monk, not a Rebbe or something like that. It was not a Yiddish. The community in Golders Green was made up mostly from German refugees, Jewish German refugees. And uh, um, that's how the shul came about. My father, my grand, uh, stepfather, had been married to, um, what was her name, Hilda Spitzer. They had no children. She had died a year or two beforehand. And But while they were living in London, they people came to, made a shul in their house, made a minion in this house, which eventually grew to become the monk shul. And um, 
What did I want to tell about? Which which school did you go to in? in we went first to the primary school, Menorah Primary School, and afterwards to the Hasmonean Girls Grammar School. Hasmonean Grammar School for girls. Yes, there was one for boys also when my husband went. That was Rabbi Schoenfeld. Yes, Rabbi Schoenfeld. He was the head. Yes, my father was uh, Rabbi Monk. I call him my father. He was very active apart from in the community with the education. He was principal of the Menorah School and it was active in with Rabbi Schoenfeld with all the the educational uh, things. Um, he was very uh, involved with all the kashult, with all the other rabbanim. And I want to tell a story about him when he was in 19, after the war in 1945, he was sent as part of British Army, he got a British Army uniform to be sent as a clergy, as a, what do you call that, a clergy uh, uh, in, uh, in English, a, um, the name escapes me, a, a, a chaplain, as a chaplain to Berger Belsen. And my grandmother Hirsch had a sister living in, in London. And she said to him, Rabbi Munk, please, will you look for my sister and my... No, she knew that my, her sister had perished. Will you look for my, my niece and, and her daughters, please? But we weren't there anymore then. Mm -hmm. So he had already heard about us. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, he was very active and we lived in a rabbi's house, which meant that we heard a lot of things going on there. We were not allowed to talk. We learned very early not to talk, but there were a lot of visitors, a lot of people who came to the house, never to mention anything that we see in the house. We were not allowed to use the phone a lot to speak to friends. The phone had to be, had to be free in case people would have shyness to phone. Our bedroom was above his, his study and we were not allowed to play music loudly there. <laughs> but we continued going to the Ezra there, we made a lot of friends, we went to summer camps. He was also the, sort of the head of the Ezra and he insisted that the Ezra there remain non-political, not uh, in no way attached to the Ezra in Israel, which belonged to the Poalei Agudat Yisrael. It was just a youth club. So this was a happy time also, and we grew up and eventually my sister decided she wanted to make Aliyah and uh, she spent a year in Israel on trial and came back. She was very happy. She, she trained to be a nursery nurse. She said she wanted to go back and eventually I think the following year, she actually, in 1965, she actually went to Israel and got a job, lived in Yerushalayim. And the summer of that year, I decided I also wanted to try it. I found a job in Shari Tzedek as a secretary in the public relations department. And then during that year, I met my husband and um, we were engaged and there was, no, in 1966 we got married. 1967, the uh, Six Day War broke out and before that was a very tense situation mm -hmm. in the country. My sister was here, she was still single and my parents in London demanded that she go home. Like all students went, left the country. She was very upset and uh, the, her colleagues at work called her traitor and she really? was terribly upset. She went back and she went back to London mm -hmm. and did some more courses. And um, then her, my father, Rabbi Munk's brother, Rabbi Michael Munk in New York, invited her to come to New York, spend some time in New York, mm -hmm. see perhaps you uh, find your your beshert in New York, and that's what happened. And Baruch Hashem, she met her husband Moshe Teitelbaum. I married Arya Bodenheimer, and she married Moshe Teitelbaum. And the interesting thing, and with this I can almost end the story, 
a Moshe family came from Austria and was helped f through the through the enormous help of Rabbi Schoenfeld to come to London. They were living in North London. Both Arye and Arye was born a week before Shavuos in the Birstead Hospital, the Jewish hospital in London. Moshe was born in the same hospital six weeks later in London. But then when he was six, they went to, uh, they went to move to America. And Arya's family, who lived in London, um, moved to Israel in 1950. So we met here and Shola met there. It's, it's and, um, unbelievable. Baruch Hashem, we have five children and many grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And Shola has an enormous family of children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem, we are the, uh, the Nakama, <laughs> if you can say it. And your family. Our family. Hashem kept us alive for a purpose and Baruch Hashem, we are fulfilling that purpose as far as we can understand. And, uh, yeah. Judith, if I can just ask, yes. what message do you impart to your children and grandchildren and to the future generations? Um, we have a rich tradition, uh, which we talk about. We pass it on and we, we show it by example and we hope that, that they will uh, see by example the good life that we lead, that God helps us. God helped us in bad times and God helps us, Hashem helps us in good times. And I hope that this message gets through and Bezrat uh, Hashem. For, all, for this also, we need Bezrat Hashem. So thank you for uh, allowing me to tell my story. And I just want to ask you, and I think it's, it's just unbelievable. Your mother, she always kept her emuna, even yes. having gone through yes. losing her husband, losing her family. Yes. She always kept her emuna, yes. her faith. She never asked any questions. Never asked any questions. There are no questions. Hashem runs the world. So you did. I really want to just thank you. This has been... <coughs> For me, I don't know, this has been the most amazing, incredible... Just Nisim after Nisim, miracles after miracles, that you have the tag from... from Bergen Belden, it's just unbelievable from Westerbrook. It's just and that you kept it. But more than that you kept the take, that your your story, your it's just there are no words, there really aren't. And I'm so incredibly grateful to you. Um you came from such an amazing family and you've continued with your family and you should just have muzzle and brocha and Amen. I'm extremely grateful to you. You're very welcome. Thank you. Um, in 1995, 50 years after the war, uh, we went on a trip uh, to Trebitz, back to all the places that we were in. Some months beforehand, some organizers who had the idea um, printed letters in the different newspapers to let, let it be known to people who had been in the train and their families that we wanted to, they wanted to arrange a trip back to Westerbog, to, to Bergen-Belsen and all the way to Trobitz. I remember there was a meeting in Tel Aviv where many people arrived and um, the organizers told us about the trip that would take place right after Pesach and uh, there on the notice boards for the first time I saw lists and lists. One of the lists was the list of people who had died on the train 
500 people out of 2,500 who had been buried along the train tracks during that journey. Well, we went on that train trip. We left two days after Pesach, which meant that my sister and brother-in-law, Shula and Moshe Teitelbaum from New York, had to leave their house, Mamash Motzei, last day of Pesach, could not take any food with them, so we took extra food for them. We had to take our kosher food with us, of course. Well, we traveled to Amsterdam, and there everybody met. And late at night, we arrived at a hotel, and in the morning, already at about 11 o'clock, we were on, on the buses, and the first stop was near the airport to pick up Shola and Moshe. And from there, I think there were four or five buses um, divided into buses by countries or language. Sort of there were the bus with the Israelis where they all spoke Hebrew. And there were buses, most buses were perhaps two buses from Israel and some buses with English speakers where people came from Australia and all over the world. I don't remember exactly where, from Holland. And we went into the English speaking uh, buses because during the trip, people started telling stories, their own stories, their own experiences from the war. And uh, I also went up for the first time to speak through the microphone to tell our story. I, I was not shy to speak in front of the people. In fact, I was happy to share my story. And um, the first stop was Vesterbog. Now, at that time, there was no, not yet the um, museum in Vesterbog that there was the, today. Um, but we were taken to the train tracks and wandering around there. I don't remember exactly what there was. After that, we went on to, to Bergen-Belsen. This trip took four or five days. I don't remember exactly. Uh, I, I could have looked it up in, in the diary that my uh, brother-in-law kept. Um, we went to Bergen-Belsen. Bergen-Belsen did have a museum. My mother went with us and she was very quiet all the time and she said this is not the Belgian Belsen that I remember, a smelly place. Of course everything had been burnt down in Belgian Belsen because it was so contaminated. All one could see was mounds, mounds of grass covered earth and there was a, there was a monument in uh, in um, memory and there were several graveyards uh, not graveyards excuse me tombstones that private people had put there in memory of their family and in fact my my early friend david he also had a a tombstone made for his father in that area there was a very serious uh, commemoration there at the at that monument. Everybody stood around. There was a, a rabbi from nearby Germany somewhere who who said words. There was a rabbi from America, Joseph Pollack. He spoke remarkably well and he has written, it's worth reading what he has written about his experiences. And other people talked and gradually people got to know each other and reminisced got about their common experiences. Of course, everybody was so many years, 50 years older than then. In fact, we met there a young woman who had been a young girl, teenage girl, when we came to Belga Belsen and she saw us and she, she saw my mother with twins and she said, 
Hey, I remember when you came in that, that day, I've never before seen a mother nurse her babies. And the interesting thing was, on that train, we met another set of twins, a boy and a girl. <laughs> they were a bit older than us. And this lady, Marianne, forget her name now, had written a book, also about the book called uh, The Four Pebbles. She used to play a game of four pebbles, meaning her children, and as long as she had four pebbles, her family would, rem would survive. So this was Bergen Belsen. We wandered around, and then we went to, I think, to Brunswick to sleep in a hotel, and they took us to historical places. Wherever we were, they, Brunswick, I think we went into the shul there, and then, then Davan, there were, there were um, ceremonies, uh, mem memorial ceremonies everywhere. Then we went to Potsdam, where the Germans, they came there and there was some ceremony. Potsdam was an important place for, for uh, agreements during, during the war. And uh, there, there they had a whole low row of Yardzad candles. People could light Yardzad candles. Um, somehow we didn't feel like doing that. We didn't feel this was something Jewish. It was, it was just, uh, I don't know. Uh, it was, uh, I don't know, I can't explain it. We didn't light the Yatsad candles. We do, we light Yatsad candles when we have Yatsad, mm -hmm. and which happened to be on Hei Our father died. Um, we came to, um, we came to Trobitz. We were staying in, in good hotels in all these places, and Trobitz. Oh, in Potsdam, I want to tell again how the God arranges things. Hashem does things in His way. Just six months beforehand, a Chabad, young Chabad family came to uh, live there and, you know, do their Chabad work. And so they cooked a warm kosher meal for us. So, and they were there just a few months and they were planning to leave soon. God placed them there just for us for that meal because other than that we had to have our own meals um, our, there were no kosher meals around. Finally we came to Trobitz and uh, we were received there as very important people and the police accompanied us. They were very worried in case some anti-Semites would harm us and uh, as we drove to Trobitz uh, there was a helicopter, police helicopter overhead and uh, police escorts for the buses. When we came there, there was a hall arranged also with, uh, with food, cold things. And uh, the mayor there, there was a muse museum made. Children there had been prepared, the school children had been prepared for our visit and learned about the history and we could wander around there and see the places. And this lady whom I told about, who looked after the uh, graves from then, the, the Jewish cemetery still there and met us there. We got presents there, souvenirs. Of, um, and, and then we, we were taken around to the, to the uh, common Kever uh, Achim uh, and uh, finally we were taken to the cemetery. There we saw the Jewish cemetery and as it happens I saw the cemetery of mother of a friend of mine from London whom at the time I didn't, wasn't sure of her history, now I know it. And there, our organization had put up a whole memorial wall with the names of the 500 people who had died during the course of that trip. Of course, my father's name was on it. And there was a train trip. Pardon? The train. On the, yes, on the train, during the train and uh, during the lost transport. It was covered and my mother was called upon to remove 
the curtain. And there was a very, very um, behovered, res respected, respect, respected, honored, honored uh, speeches and ceremony. And of course, at every place, there was um, Kaddish said, we had a good chazan with us, Nordheim, and uh, always Kaddish and at the end singing Anima Amin and then the Israelis singing Hatikva and there were some people there who came to a grave of their ancestor and had brought brought Israeli flags to put there, they were sitting around there. It was very memorable. Part of what happened during our walks in, in Trebitz Suddenly we lost my mother. She was already 80 years old. We were getting worried about her. And we found her and she said, I said, where were you? She said, I was wandering around. I was looking for a short, certain shop. I remember walking around and every time I walked around in Trobitz, I used to see myself in the reflection of that window and I saw how beautifully slim I was. I was looking for that shop window again. I couldn't find it. Of course, she was terribly thin from uh, from uh, the war experiences. This was a very meaningful trip for us. It brought it all so much home to the whole story we had heard all those years. Now we could see it with our own eyes. And we were very grateful for the organizers. This uh, They had made a, a, uh, an aguda, an organization, and afterwards sent a lot of films and photos, and uh, there's a lot of correspondence still going on. And uh, this petered out, of course, uh, as things do naturally. But this was a good experience and also helped us to pass our story on to our children and grandchildren because we saw it with our eyes. Can I ask, was your mother very, very emotional? Was she very nervous to go back? She was in a very quiet way. She was very quiet. She never spoke about her emotions. The only emotion she ever showed was anger. She never much... She showed about happiness when she was happy, but she didn't talk about emotions. But I could see that she was tense for this, towards this journey. And after this journey, she asked that we should all be home for Shabbat. Our children partly in yeshivas, or we had two married children then already, so we all, she wanted to talk about it on that Shabbat afterwards. And she did back. speak? Yeah, she spoke a bit, yes. Yeah. That, then she told us about how she screamed and they, when they took my father's body down. And then actually, I had correspondent, correspondent with that lady in uh, in Germany to find our father's grave, or I don't remember with whom I spoke, or with the uh, the place near to where he died, and they said they had found two places of graves uh, recently, and one the bones had come to a surface and they had been removed to a churchyard close to Leipzig somewhere. They had been brought to a, uh, to a, a dental, uh, the dent, de, uh, dent the, t the teeth had been evaluated for... Forensic, it's for, a yes. forensic dental. So I tried to contact, I, my mother in her fa files had apparently contacted my father's dentist and got pictures of his de uh, his teeth. And when I received the explanation from them of the forensic explanations, and I sent it to to a uh, dentist here, a Dutch dentist in Rovot, and he said there was no similarity. Mm -hmm. So possibly this was not where he was buried. And they took us on a special trip, special uh, van, to the area where they thought these these cave, these graves were, and 
we couldn't really see. Mm -hmm. We couldn't really see. Of course, at every place, my 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 brother-in-law was all the time saying to Hilim, I remember at all these places. They took us to this graveyard where these these other bones were reburied. Buried. This was an extreme, apparently that yellow blanket that my mother had, my mother was looking for that yellow blanket at the grave. <laughs> and uh, they, they hadn't found anything like that. Apparently that's, she had, it was a blanket of ours. Nothing came up of that trip. That was a pity. It was a disappointment. And my brother-in-law kept on saying, perhaps you can look further, further, but I did hear a story of somebody after many, many years, the Bilbaum family, I think, who found their mother's grave after so many years. I don't remember the story. Perhaps it's something for you to discover. Um, was it the Bilbaum family or Emmanuel family? Perhaps Emmanuel family. I'm not sure. Anyway, but miracles you, happen. But happen it uh, was a very memorial, very memorable, and uh, it was like... Important trip. In a way, closing a circle. Yes, yes. yes. You did thank you so, so much. You're welcome. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, well, um, you've seen the past, and this is our future. Baruch Hashem, this was at our 50th wedding, wedding anniversary with our five children. One, two, <laughs> Tzvi. Ruven, Uri, Elisheva and Binyamin with their families and here the whole crowd saying hello and uh, since then, this is four years ago, um, more grandchildren have married and great-grandchildren were born and uh, yes, thank God. <laughs> well, you just muzzle and broke Amen. <laughs>